Now we're considering the, par the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our objective in considering them is to see the manner of the kingdom, to see the character of Christ. <clears throat> To sort of get an intuition about what we can expect to receive when we're around the Lord and what it takes to receive something from the Lord, what He recognizes. And uh, Jesus does not operate by rote or mechanically like a robot is wound up. His, his, his kingdom is an intelligent kingdom. It's a higher order of intelligence. It's not intelligence after man's order, but it's an intelligent kingdom, rational kingdom, be a better way to say it. And if you can see the rationale of it, it will bless you. Amen. Tonight we're going to consider the <clears throat> healing of the nobleman's son. Mm -hmm. The text is found in John, the fourth chapter, verse 46 through 54. So Jesus came again in the Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. So there. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Mm -hmm. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Mm -hmm. And the man mm -hmm. believed the word mm -hmm. that Amen. Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Amen. Mm -hmm. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then he inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he himself believed. Amen. And his whole house. Amen. <laughs> This is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. <laughs> Don't you like the candor with which, after a remarkable statement like that, John said, this is the second miracle. <laughs> Those of us say, you know, your heart's sort of bubbling over, say, well, this is the second. I can hardly wait for the next. Amen. I want to briefly rehearse the background of this miracle. It's sort of set the context of how Jesus works. The second chapter, you remember, recorded his first miracle in Cana of Galilee. And following that, he wrought some great miracles at the Passover feast, you remember. And it was after this that he met with Nicodemus, one of the most significant uh, sections of teaching Jesus gave to Nicodemus by night. <coughs> If I didn't have any more reason for meeting even in service, that would be one right there. Amen. Jesus is prone to teach at night. And of course his dialogue covers the third chapter of John, verses 1 through 21. A lot of people don't know that John 3.16 was spoken to Nicodemus. <laughs> I've heard Nicodemus sort of bad mouth, saying, well, he came by night to Jesus because he was scared to come by day. Well... Those people, they'd be better off probably not to speak. Maybe they should just invite people to church and not talk to them. Because Jesus doesn't divulge things like he did to Nicodemus, who are scared people. Uh -huh. Yes, John 3.16, we're still poking to Nicodemus. Might interest you just to read, you know, that section. Sometimes you lose sight of the fact that this is what he told Nicodemus. So after this miracle of returning water to wine, after he, many miracles at the Passover feast, this, he's teaching Nicodemus this lengthy mm -hmm. section. Then he, from there he takes his disciples down into Gal, in, uh, from the land into the land of Judea. John 3.22 tells us this. After these things, that being when he taught Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples, Jesus came, Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. There he tarried and, and baptized. 
Another text of Scripture, John 4, tells us uh, that though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Mm -hmm. Say, so why didn't he? Well, you could imagine what people would say. Mm -hmm. I was baptized by Jesus. You know, I could just... <laughs> Look at the trouble Corinth had with who baptized him. So his reputation began to grow here, is what I wanted to see. And he goes down into Judea, a lot of baptizing is going on there. <laughs> and it came to pass that his reputation began to spread, and word got out that he was baptizing more people than John was. At this point, John wasn't yet in prison. And you can imagine what kind of uh, agitation this might cause. And Jesus, the scripture says, when he heard that... Uh, the uh, Pharisees knew he was baptizing more people than John. He diverts, he heads down another place, and he passes through Samaria in John, the fourth chapter. And there he confronts a woman at a well, and it's a lengthy, lengthy discourse to this woman and to the people that came out from Samaria to hear him. It covers John 4, verses 3 through 42. It's kind of a lengthy Passage. I'm showing the context of this miracle was a bunch of teaching. This is what you, what I want you to, what, don't want you to miss. A lot of teaching. And after he talked to this woman, he waited two more days, and John 4, 43 says, Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country which is in Capernaum, which is where this nobleman's from, is coming to see him. Mm -hmm. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, and they also went, they also went into the feast. You see his reputation is growing, and he, uh, he knows that the home where he would set up shop, so to speak, in Capernaum, they wouldn't uh, be too interested in him, so he comes... He comes down into finally into Cana where he performed his first miracle. Now, a couple of observations I want to make about these two lengthy discourses to Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. There was no miracle there. He didn't work a miracle for either Nicodemus mm -hmm. or this woman. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And you've got to ask yourself the question, which of these people, which, which people that he worked with got the most? Mm -hmm. Was it was it that was it uh, the people that turned the water to wine? You suppose the people benefited most from that, or did the people benefit most like Nicodemus? Mm -hmm. Now you have to ask yourself these questions, mm -hmm. because uh, Christ's miracles were to buttress what he said. Right. I can tell you that if Jesus had, wasn't saying anything, he wouldn't have done anything. Yeah. Jesus also did not initiate a miracle crusade. No place. No place did Jesus set up shop to do a lot of miracles. Right. Just interesting. People do this today. You know. mm -hmm. They have a miracle crusade, whatever, whatever that is. It's, and we're not questioning do they or don't they. We're not, we're not even in that territory. We're just saying this isn't what Jesus did. Right. So whoever does that, like they're on their own. Or to their own master, they stand or fall. But that isn't what Jesus did. And we don't know apostle did it either. So it's just interesting to observe these things. Most of the time, the people generally came to Jesus who received miracles. As a general, there are a few exceptions to this, like the Gadarene demoniac, Jesus came to him. And the widow of Nain, Jesus came to her. So there are some exceptions. This isn't something cast in stone. But for the most part, people that uh, Jesus wrought a miracle upon them came to him. And it sort of gives you the idea behind the kingdom. The kingdom is sort of built on this premise that you come to him. Amen. That's sort of the premise it's built upon. And most people without, with very few exceptions, who received something from Christ, came to him. That's the mode of the kingdom. Jesus said, come to me. It just, and God draws people to the Son. So he said, come to me. I say that because there's a sort of a fatalistic view of God's working where people say, well, when it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'll, just, right. I'll just sit here and wait till it happens. Well, mm -hmm. that's not the way God works. He has a timetable, but the people become involved in the timetable. They come to Him. 
Now, while he's here in Cana, away from Capernaum, because he said a prophet's not without honor except in his own country, as with the people don't appreciate him, is where he is, where he was, that's where they don't appreciate him. And most some of us have found this indeed to be the case. It's indeed the case. While he is there, a certain nobleman hears about it. He hears that Jesus has come out of Judea into the territory of Galilee again. A nobleman was a royal official. He was someone who was a, by blood or by office was related to the king. He was a, what you might call a dignitary of some sort. And we know from Scripture in 1 Corinthians 1.26 that not many noble are called. Because it doesn't say not any noble are called. Yeah. But not many noble. Mm -hmm. now here's, here's, here's an exception out of the rule. Not many noble are called. Now the scripture said he heard. He heard. Exact text says when he heard that Jesus was come out of Gal Judea into Galilee. When he heard. When he, when he heard that. <coughs> See, a lot of people came to Jesus because they heard he was around. See, there's some people who never, they never hear the right people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're never tuned in to the right <clears throat> conversation. You know yourself that there come a time when you heard some, Jesus was connected with somebody or some event and you came. See, some people don't even talk to those kind of people. The nobleman did. He heard. He was like a like other people who came hearing about Jesus. I'm going to make a point here. It's a very important kingdom point. Mark 2, 1 says, Again, he entered in Capernaum after some days, and it was noised abroad that he was in the house. People heard about it and came. And there's another instance of this in Gennesaret. Mark 6, 55. And he ran through the whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick. When they heard he was, who he was, they heard where he was, they started bringing the sick. In. And again, Bartimaeus says in Matthew 17, 14, when they were cut, then... When they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling to them down and saying, and it was this Bartimaeus, he heard, he asked, what's, what's going on? They said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing through. Now listening to the right people and the right thing is imperative. And there is an obligation laid upon mortals that when Jesus is near, it's their business. To get there. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's sort of a principle of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. When Jesus comes to his own, it's serious business when his own receives him not. Hmm? Yes. When Jesus comes into the world and the world's made by him and the world doesn't know him, that is serious business. That's right. For Jesus to visit a fair town like Joplin. And people not to know it? This is serious business. You know, you may be able to trace back in your life a time when you suddenly became alert of the Lord's presence and the availability of salvation or perhaps the availability to go on into perfection or to receive something from God and you made it your business to get where Jesus was. That's a, that's a man of the kingdom. This is how it works. People that don't want to go to Jesus generally don't get anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he went to him. He went to him. He didn't send a... This is a nobleman. He didn't send a servant and ask Jesus to come to him. He went to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now this again is a man of the kingdom. Like the woman of Matthew 9... 20, a woman who was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came, came behind him. It was a, he was a crowd surrounding him. She was weak from this 12-year flow of blood that had never stopped. 
and she came to him mm -hmm. through a crowd. Showing the man of the kingdom here. She came to him again. There were the two blind men of Matthew 9, 28. When he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said, Yea, Lord. But you've got to get close enough for Jesus to ask you a question. They came to him. And of course, there was the man with the lunatic child, Matthew 17, 14. When they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down, and he asked him, Heal my son, my son's a lunatic. You'd say epileptic. Actually, it was the demon, the demon possessed boy in this mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. But he came to him. So I want to show, for, first of all, the nobleman heard. Mm -hmm. You want to live your life. And I don't suggest that you don't do this, but I'm saying hone up the skill on this. You want to live your life so if a good word is in the vicinity about Jesus, that somehow it gets to you. Uh -huh. That you're listening to the right kind of people. And you're around the proper type of people so that if something is going on in the Lord, at least it comes to you. Some people, the friends they make, they're not apt to hear anything about Jesus. Right. The places they go, they're not apt to hear anything about Jesus. This nobleman was not like that. And then he came to Jesus. Now, Jesus was not your ordinary man. But he humbled, and he was not an ordinary man, but he he came, he left whatever pressing duties he had. This is a nobleman now. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a man that lived under the bridge, so to speak. He came to Jesus anyway. And when he got there, he besought him. He besought him. Fervently pled with him. Now in this case, he's also like the people of Gennesaret. They did the same thing. Mark 5.23 says that, that a man, Jairus, besought him greatly. My little daughter lies at the point of death, I pray thee, come. <laughs> he besought him. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be casual when you make your petitions to the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord is not impressed with Amen. casualness. Yeah. Amen. He is impressed with fervency. Amen. Again, the Syrophoenician woman. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation and nation and she besought him that he would cast the devil out of her daughter. I besought this is not like a one sentence thing. It's like the idea she kept on kept on asking him to do this. Uh -huh. And again Luke five twelve it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold a man full of leprosy who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought see this is the manner of the kingdom to beseech. Maybe you have heard the uh, Someone say, oh, wait a minute, if you have to say it twice, that means you don't have faith. <laughs> well, this again is a stupid saying. Mm -hmm. This is something someone who doesn't know Jesus would say. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself prayed three times for the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you think he feels about some dumb remark like that? Mm -hmm. This is not good thinking at all. Yeah. If you want something from Jesus, you better not dare to believe that your faith is so strong the first time you mention it, that's the end of the matter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Jesus wants to draw it out of you. Amen. Bring it out of you a little more. And he'll linger and bring it out a little more for you. Amen. Petitioning, beseeching. It's a matter of the kingdom. It's a trait of faith. Mm -hmm. A trait of faith is I'll not let you go till I get the blessing. Yeah. Amen. It's a trait. He pled and made strong appeals. Also, you see Jesus' uh, uh, response to this kind. He patiently waits. He doesn't interrupt the man saying, no need to beg, I'm all powerful. He just, he's, he's inclined toward this sort of thing. What I'm telling you is that his grace flows to a person who's willing to beseech and plead and beg, if you please. Yes. Yeah. And present the petition. It's like he feeds virtue and grace to the person so they can keep yeah. keep saying it. See? And here's something else. How would you proceduralize beseeching? <laughs> if someone was to say, now I'd like, we're going to have a workshop on how to beseech, what, what would they say? How? <laughs> you can't teach anybody to beseech. Yeah. The thing that teaches you to beseech is a keen sense of the need. Yeah. That's what it is. I, I just love this, that 
When you come to Christ, you've got to get out of routines and procedures and this you got to get out of that, and your heart's got to be the thing that motiv motivates you. Now, what does he say to the, uh, to the Lord? He says, well, <laughs> come down to Capernaum. That's just the place he, he left, you know. He said, <laughs> Capernaum, that's where Jesus was located. Matthew 4, 31, 13 tells you that. That Jesus left Nazareth, came down to Capernaum, and he, he dwelt there and stayed there. Let me give you a word that uh, that Jesus said to the people at Capernaum. He said that it was going to be better off for a day of people in Sodom on the day of judgment than for them. So this was not like a, a place where much faith existed. Not in Capernaum. There's where he was in fact. In fact, he was rejected in Capernaum. He said, the mighty works were done in thee. We're, we're done in something, we're done in thee. See, but there was a, this was a citadel of unbelief. But, but, even though Jesus is not received in a place, that doesn't mean someone in that place won't be received by him. So here comes a nobleman from a place that rejected Jesus, which means he wasn't caught up in the fall. He didn't get caught up in it. So you may, it's quite possible that you may be in a place where Christ is not really viewed with, uh, with any sense of urgency or sought with any sense of urgency, but that doesn't mean you can. Right. Not at all. Now he asks, uh, he pleads with Jesus, he uh, said to us, heal my son. Come and heal my son. It seems to me that he sort of presumes that Jesus really knows about this already. He doesn't uh, enter into an elaborate introduction say, you know, I'm a nobleman from... Capernaum and my son has been ill for a long time and he just says come and heal my son and then he uh, he figured his faith wasn't as strong as some he figured he's at the point of death and he was his view as I see it that death would pretty much move it into a hopeless condition mm -hmm. he didn't think about Jesus raising the dead like Abraham thought God will raise Isaac from the dead if I offer him right. see this isn't he didn't think this way, but it wasn't because he was deficient, he just, he was unlearned, see, mm -hmm. and the Lord is very gracious, very gracious to him. His faith, like, reaches out, he's, he's in an impossible condition, his son's at the point of death, means ready to die, just, mm -hmm. it looks like the next thing for my son is going to be death. Yeah. And then we learn from his servants that it was a, that was a fever, mm -hmm. at least the fever was involved, maybe that would be a better word to say it. A fever was involved, like, like Simon's mother-in-law, same sort of thing. Now, faith sees beyond the circumference of possibility. Amen. It's obvious this nobleman had exhausted any resources he had, and, and he comes to Jesus, and the situation is an impossible situation. He's at the point of death, but can you see his faith sort of reaching, mm -hmm. reaching out? Now, I don't know what all he had heard, this nobleman, but whatever he'd heard about Jesus is sort of fueled faith. This is the kind of this is the kind of preaching, teaching, discussions, whatever you you submit yourself to. It has to be the kind of thing that fuels faith. That, Amen. That in the hour of crisis, that you just go to Christ. Amen. That it's got to be that kind of thing that feed. If it doesn't do that, you, it's damaging. Yeah. Damaging to say the least. Uh -huh. Now the Lord tests this nobleman. <clears throat> you notice that he doesn't—he doesn't have quite have the faith of of the uh, <clears throat> centurion who says, "Speak a word." Mm -hmm. he, he, he wasn't that advanced. He felt he had to come down to the house. See? But Jesus doesn't despise that. Jesus takes. If it's a faith in the beginning stage, Jesus will take it from there. Amen. If it's a more advanced faith where the person sees you can just say it and it's done, Jesus takes it from there. But you gotta you have to present your petition from where you're at. Yeah. And not not pretend, not to, not not say you can do it if you say it. If you can't see that, don't that's not what to say. Yeah. You have to be able to see it. And if uh, God help you to see come to the point where you can see if Jesus just speaks a word, that's, it settles the problem. But if you are not at that point, don't, don't pretend you are. Instead, say, come down to the house. Mm -hmm. Just say that. 
And incidentally, Jesus didn't go down to his house. Right. As you see. So he took him where he, from his faith from where he was at. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus tests his faith. <coughs> he said, well, except you see miracles, you won't believe. Now how do you suppose that sounded? Hmm? How do you suppose it sounded if someone comes forward in a fellowship meeting and they have a some kind of a crisis and they ask for prayer? And so uh, say they uh, they ask uh, Brother Aaron, brother said, would you ask the brethren to pray for this? And Brother Aaron says, well, if you don't see signs and wonders, you won't believe. It would be the response. It didn't dampen this man's <laughs> it didn't dampen this man's spirit at all. Because mm -hmm. Jesus was testing this. He's testing his faith. Now I want to show you some examples how Jesus does do this. Don't get used to Jesus just jumping every time you want something. Yeah. Sometimes he'll put you to the test. Here's some examples. Mm -hmm. The uh, two blind men. The old two blind men sitting by the wayside when they heard that Jesus passed by cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And apparently this, they keep on, Jesus just keep, keeps walking. Finally the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. Jesus wasn't doing anything. So they said, Man, this, this is not the right time. Fellas, this isn't the right time. Jesus is obviously not paying any attention to you. But they cried out the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. What was that? That was Jesus testing them. Uh -huh. How bad do you want the thing? Uh -huh. How bad do you want it? Or here's the disciples. They, Jesus said, Get in the boat and go to the other side. They get in the boat, they go, they hit a storm halfway across. And they, uh, it's just about to do them in. And the scripture says, Jesus is back on the mountain. He's looking out. He sees them out there. Here's what it says, Mark 6, 48. He saw them toiling and rowing. So, you know, if they can just stop rowing, just come back to shore. But they, rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. That's where this song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, that some people that I know object to singing so much, that's what it was based on. What was Jesus doing? Testing their faith. Mm -hmm. He's testing their faith. This makes sense. He's going to walk right on. <laughs> Ooh, you don't want Jesus to walk by you in a storm. You hail him down. Amen. Do it. <laughs> And here's another <coughs> Syrophoenician woman. Lord, I'm showing you God tests faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want something unusual from God? Is that what you want? You, you got you got something supernatural you want God to do? Is that it? Well, this is not that we encourage you in this. But you better have an unusual faith. You want God to do something unusual? You better have an unusual faith. I don't think he's going to do something unusual for people who are just kind of casual, haphazard. So this woman, she's following after Jesus, calling out to him. Finally, she gets his attention. <laughs> she says, oh, my daughter's vexed with the devil. Heal her. And Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled. For it's not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Mm -hmm. okay. Now you have to come to the part where you, Jesus can talk to you like this. Some of people might think, well, that sort of destroy your self-image. Well, fine. <laughs> self-image needs to be destroyed as far as I'm concerned. Amen. That would certainly destroy it, wouldn't it? The children, which means you're not one. Uh -huh. That's what she was. She was a Gentile. Uh -huh. The children, the children, not some children. The ch let, the ch let the children be filled. Now, the children weren't asking for anything. Yeah. Keep in mind. <laughs> let the children, he's testing her. Mm -hmm. This is Christ's manner. And when he said, uh, it's, not, it's not meat or proper to give the children bread to dogs, she says, truth, yep. mm -hmm. truth, but the crumbs, Lord, the crumbs, yes. under the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You let the dogs have those, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she didn't get crumbs, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He gave her some bread yeah. because she knew she wasn't worthy. 
And that attracts. That attracts Jesus. Here's another example. <clears throat> the man comes to Jesus and asks him to heal his son. He says, Jesus, he says, if you can do anything, help us. Ah, Jesus, Jesus can do anything. Yeah. But the man didn't say, Jesus, I know you can do everything. He said, if. So Jesus said, if you can believe. Mm -hmm. All things are possible to him that believeth. He's testing his faith. Mm -hmm. The man passed the test because he said, I believe. Help them unbelief. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now here's another. <clears throat> I'm showing you that Jesus puts faith to the test. That when you're with Jesus and you want an extended stay with him or you want something unusual from him, you, you've got to be willing to pass the test. Mm -hmm. you're, you may be in a crisis and you may think it's got to be done right now. But when you're before the Master, it doesn't have to be done right now. Yeah. The Lord can wait till Lazarus dies and then resolve the dilemma. Mm -hmm. okay, this is how Jesus is. And this is the two on the road to Emmaus. <laughs> Jesus joined them. He began teaching them. Their hearts sort of began to burn within them. Luke 24, 28 says, They drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would go further. Mm -hmm. It's like he saw them turning off, and it's like he said, Oh, hope we meet, hope we meet again sometime. They didn't want to go for that. They said they constrained him to come in. Amen. So the Lord tests faith. <clears throat> Why? Because faith is the preeminent issue, not what you need to have done. Mm -hmm. Faith is the preeminent issue. Amen. And the scripture makes this quite plain. <coughs> there are some people who came to Jesus and they tempted him. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees. They came and tempted him and desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. Well, Jesus could could well, I was about to say Jesus could do this, but now I'm not I'm not sure that this was the case because he did only what he saw the Father doing. So <laughs> they had asked something that was not right. What I'm showing you here is that faith is the, when, you, when someone says, help my unbelief, that, that touches the heart of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Or to look at it another way, when you're persistent, and your faith is persistent, that touches his heart more than your need touches his heart. He can be touched with the feeling of your infirmities, but your faith touches him even more than that. Mm -hmm. Don't bank on Jesus just feeling sorry for you. Right. He, he can do this. I understand, I understand that. But that isn't, that isn't what should compel you. Jesus will, uh, he'll understand. <laughs> that, that, I understand it's a valid approach, but that's not the best approach. You want to come with your faith in good, good standing and press him. When Jesus was on the cross, they said um, he saved others himself. He cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross. And we will believe. See, well, oh, no, faith. <laughs> Jesus isn't going to do this so you can have faith. It's your faith that moves him to do it. Uh -huh. Quite a bit of difference. John 2, 18. He answered, uh, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing thou doest these things? He didn't say, well, let me, uh, I'll, I'll work you a little sign here. I'll, uh. I'll turn a little of this water into wine here, whatever. No, faith is the issue. Where faith is lacking, signs are not in vogue. Jesus doesn't work signs in the environment of unbelief, which might very well account for why the miraculous has diminished over the years. It has been, uh, some people have taken it upon themselves to sort of invent a special theology that they think explains why. They say, well, there, what miracles were by well, only for a certain time. Yeah. Well, Gideon thought that too. See, mm -hmm. It's been a long century since there had been any kind of miracle when Gideon was there. In fact, he said, where's the miracles? Yeah. Well, see, it isn't that the miracles are by clustered in time for God's glory. Mm -hmm. If you go through, you'll find that they're like clusters of them. And there's nothing to lead any of God's people to believe that a cluster can't occur in our time. That's right. That there's faith there. Faith can be generated and built. 
You could have a cluster of them here, just like he had a cluster when Jesus was here, and Elijah, there was a cluster of them there, see? You're in the judge, Elijah, there's a cluster of them there. Mm -hmm. So here and there, there were clusters of these miracles through history, because God always responds to faith. Right. And for God to work, and for it, what's the purpose for God to work if it's not transcendent to nature? If it's God does something, then he, it's the same thing that a man down the street does, What's that going to bring glory to God? It's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So faith touches God to work, and when God works, He's always extraordinary. Amen. And of a miraculous nature. <clears throat> well, the nobleman passes the test here, and he doesn't <clears throat> engage in an argument with the Lord. He says, Sir, I can almost see him he's like exasperated. Sir, come down ere my child die. Well, that almost sounds arrogant. Well, this is faith. Mm -hmm. He really didn't know how to. How do you? How do you try and talk Jesus into coming down? I mean, how, what do you say? You just he just pled. Mm -hmm. That's how you say it. Yeah. See, you may not be able to cite a lot of reasons why. So we we hope that you can. We understand mm -hmm. about you producing strong. Arguments and presenting your case, but if you, your cause, but if you can't do this, you can always say, "Come down." Yeah. Ere my son dies, he did feel Jesus had to come down. It wasn't like the centurion, as I said, who, who in Matthew eight eight said, "Just speak the word." Now, <laughs> he was uh, he was uh, of royalty, so he probably was kind of used to having his way. I kind of, mm -hmm. I don't think he necessarily wanted his thought that Christ would do what he said, but my thought here is that he humbled himself. Mm -hmm. He pled. Uh -huh. This is a nobleman. This is a nobleman. Yeah. He pled. Sir, come down, ere my child die. And in this in this way it's good to reason with the Lord. <laughs> come down ere my child die. Here's some more reasoning the man with the Possessed sons that helped my unbelief. See, I'm showing you it's the how he reasoned, how he extended his plea. He extended his plea first, but said, Come down, or else he'll die. Or the man with the possessed child says, Help my unbelief. Or the woman, Syrophoenician woman said, This is true, but the dogs eat the crumbs. See, they take the land back a little further and show that they're really not seeking for something that detracts from Christ. In other words, this nobleman went as far as his faith could take. Mm -hmm. and whatever your faith you have, uh, take it as far as it'll go. Amen. Don't just take, if you, if you have a, a faith that can walk ten steps, don't walk five. Because mm -hmm. you won't get anything. God operates when your faith pushes its limits and goes to the furthest extremity. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, how can I know how... How far my faith will go? Well, you won't know it like irrationally in your intellect. As long as this thing's on your heart, keep keep pushing. Yes. As long as long as there's a little glimmer of hope, keep keep pushing. See, that's that's what he wants. See, that's what Jesus wants when he works these sort of things. He doesn't want to work it where you do just a little bit of what you can do, or where you take a couple of little steps and that's it when you could have walked a mile. Mm -hmm. Because this would not produce much glory for him. Right. But when you when all your faith's in the matter, then your glory will be proper mm -hmm. afterward. So Jesus honors his faith <laughs> with a word. He said, uh, "Your son lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go, what's that? go your way. Your son lives. How's that? With a word." Yonder. And the scripture says the man believed his word. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, I'm suggesting that he wouldn't have been able to believe that word if he hadn't oppressed this issue. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't kept beseeching when it sounded like Jesus was shutting him down. If he hadn't pushed further, I don't think he could have believed this word. Mm -hmm. But if you take your faith as far as it'll go, it'll pick up again when the Lord speaks the word. Yeah. So you take Paul's praying for his thorn to be removed. He prayed for it three times. He went as far as his faith could go, and when it went that, then the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. He got an answer. See? Mm -hmm. Take your faith as far as it can go. Now, the, the word the man believed was six words. 
Six words, go thy way, thy son lives. How's that? Well, six words, you say, well, that's, that's not very much. And that wouldn't, you could, that'd make a small sentence on a greeting card. Now, that's not very much. But when you believe what Jesus says, even when it's six words, it does a lot. And it did something for him. And he went his way. Of course, it was given to him to believe, just as it is you. Philippians 1.29 said it was given to you to believe. So what Je if you can step back and see it, what Jesus did, he worked with this man until he could believe what he said. That's what he did. And you should not doubt that he will do the same with you. He'll work with you till you can believe what he says. Mm -hmm. Then you, when you get to that point, he'll just say, your son lives. Mm -hmm. And you go your way. Now, to confirm, to confirm the reality of this miracle, let's look at the of his response. He first he he, did, he quit he quit pleading. He quit pleading at this word. No more pleading. No more beseeching. And he went his way. And about a day down the road, because when the servants met him, they talked about the son being healed yesterday. Remember, so uh -huh. so he was he was a full day on the road here. And his servants met him, and what do they say? They say the exact words that Jesus said. Jesus said, Thy son liveth. The servants say, Thy son liveth. <laughs> That's God. This is how God orchestrates things. He confirms his word this way, see? And now the servant, he, he wants to, he puts this to the test too. He says, well, uh, about what hour did he begin to amend? <laughs> Some people would have forgot what hour Jesus said that. Yeah. Ah, this man didn't forget mm -hmm. what hour Jesus said that. You want to remember the details of your prayer. Mm -hmm. You don't want to say, let's see, when, when was it we prayed? When was it we prayed about that? You want to be able to know when the petition was lifted up. And they were very, very precise now in, in what they said to him. He said, well, he read the exact words here. Mm -hmm. He said, he began to amend yesterday at the seventh hour. The fever left. Well, he said, when did he begin to amend? And it just, <laughs> it wasn't a process. He said, about the seventh hour, the fever left him. Mm -hmm. What a marvelous, uh, <laughs> marvelous truth. Let me tell you this, that if you inquire into the works of God... Uh, if I may be rather personal, if you were inquire like into the working of God with Sadie, mm -hmm. little Sadie, you'll never be disappointed. You can probe yeah. what God has done and you will not be disappointed. It will not fail under the probe. Right. Not, what, not when he really works. Mm -hmm. You can probe the works of men. Yeah, but you know, it's a little point of opinion. We're not quite sure whether this really... That won't happen when you probe the working of the Lord. You've got really, really got to believe this. It will not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the precise work will stand precise inquiry. Mm -hmm. At what point did your desired change begin? See, some of you, I know I've been here. I hear your prayers, hear your requests. Some of you have experienced, it, it, it's been answered. Yeah. These things have happened, all right? Yeah. About what hour did they happen? Uh -huh. When did they begin to happen? Mm -hmm. Every time. You'll trace it back to when Jesus spoke. Yeah. It'll be traced back to a word. Mm -hmm. Whether it was a word in your prayer, a word you heard, you'll trace it back mm -hmm. to a word. Amen. Every time. Divine works do have a beginning. Mm -hmm. Let me give you some examples of this. <laughs> and how the apostles, they'd bank on you knowing when it began. Because you can think back and it edifies you to back to a point in time. And you know when it happened. Ephesians 1, 12 and 13 read, <clears throat> That ye should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He took them back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. When this happened. And it was a word. Mm -hmm. And they believed it. To the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2.13.
For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you to believe. Mm -hmm. So if you can receive the word in, in jest, as Sister Tasha remind us, yep. in jest, mm -hmm. it will work. Yeah. And here again, Hebrews 10.32. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated. Mm -hmm. See? It's a, the works of God have a beginning, a point you can go back mm -hmm. and see when it started. And so faith does associate with God's Word. Confidence and assurance come at the point where the work <coughs> connects with the Word. At that point, assurance happens. You'll never build assurance on just the fact that God did something in your life. Mm -hmm. It's when what He did is associated with what He said, that's when confidence and assurance happens. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, this confirms see, the genuineness of the miracle. And it says that after this, the man himself believed. Now, that's interesting because when Jesus spoke the word, it said he believed the word. So if people think believed is like a point in time kind of, once you believe, you always believe. You just, see, belief increase. This this is a second stage of believing. Yeah, this he comes up higher. See, he believed the word, but now he himself believed as he was convinced of it more thoroughly. Amen. It's like he, when he first believed, it was like twilight. Mm -hmm. When he believed himself, then the, the thing opened up. Opened up to it. That's what God's works are designed to do is to open up mm -hmm. the thing further to you. And how about this? The man believed with his whole house. Mm -hmm. So how, how did the, how, why did his house believe? Well, he had to tell them. How did they know that Jesus had spoken his word at the seventh hour? The house didn't know this. He had to tell them that. Mm -hmm. When he related this to them, the whole house <laughs> believed. See all the glory Jesus got out of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Servants, mm -hmm. they heard a little more about it. And his whole household. And then this uh, rather, <laughs> rather strange remark, he says, this now is the second miracle. <laughs> now for the nobleman, this was an epochal work. Yeah. But for <laughs> Jesus, it was something he did while he was going along the road. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you have to see it. Amen. He's mm -hmm. out his way walking along. and that's, that's how it was for Jesus. This was Amen. no big thing for Jesus. It was a big thing for, yes. for the nobleman. Yes. But not for Jesus. Amen. And this is a, one of the great qualities of faith. Faith will convince you that what's really big for you is really little for Jesus. Mm -hmm. and when you see that, you're able to present your case from a posture of a helpless person Mm -hmm. If God doesn't work, it's not going to be done, and you know it. Let me assure you, this touches God's heart. Amen. The reason like this. Mm 